and think about how to um, represent convection in models that don't resolve. So we're talking about parameterization of convection. Is this working? No. 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 <laughs> So yesterday we talked about what convection is and what it does. And now that we know that, we can think about how to um, represent convection in models that don't resolve. So we're talking about parameterization of convection. Is this working? No. 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 Is it on? The manga to... And that's actually something you, you don't usually find in textbooks. And so we'll, we'll, we'll spend quite a bit of time on basic concepts because I think it's quite important again. So we'll do a bit of math again. I'm, I'm sorry, but it's it's the stuff that is really, really important, but you don't find anywhere in the textbook. So you get the opportunity to at least find out where certain assumptions come from, what assumptions are being made, and so on and so forth. Um, all right, so we already, let's let's start by thinking about, so we know how convection works, we know it interacts with the larger scales, um, and we have already derived the equations as to what we need to represent, right? So now it's a question of how do we represent that. But before we go and do that, we have to think a bit what, what constraints might we have when we think about convection parameterization. So what, there's some constraints, some things we want the parameterization to do. So for instance, uh, no matter, what we do, it's not, my thingy is not working yet. Okay, let me try again. Is it on there? Oh, hang on. There it is. Okay, so we want to maintain, so one of the roles is we saw that uh, the convection interacts with the uh, um, large scale circulation. So, whatever parameterization we come up with, one of the things we wanted to do is lead in our models to a realistic structure um, of the thermodynamic and the wind in the, in the vertical. We also wanted to have a sort of mean climate that's realistic. We wanted to rain in the right places at the right time. We also want to get some, not just the mean correct, but we also know the convection interacts with modes of variability in the atmosphere. The most famous and most recent discussed is the Madden-Julian oscillation, for instance, and and for India, the summer equivalent of that, the uh, intraseasonal oscillation, in the, the summer intraseasonal oscillation here. And then we wanted to also respond correctly to changes in boundary conditions, like uh, changes in SST or changes in um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, changes to radiated force. But at the same time, um, we know we can't just build the most complicated parameterization that we can because then it gets computationally so expensive that we can't use it. So there's this compromise that we have to make between the physics um, and the um, computational side of things. So this is just a sort of as, as means of background. Now, what does the convection parameterization have to do um, in the model? Well, there's three things we have to uh, predict in a convection parameterization. Um, one is, if in every grid box, at every time step, we need to decide whether there's convection at that grid box or not. Okay. So often we also want to decide what type of convection do we have at this grid box. Right? Is it shadow clouds, deep clouds, organized or not organized? Although very few models, as we'll see, deal with organized. Okay, so we need to make this decision, and uh, there's a, in, in the jargon of convection parameterization, people call that the trigger model. Okay, so each convection scheme, no matter what it is, no matter how it's designed, no matter what other properties it has, each convection scheme in any model has one of those trigger models. And it turns out to be quite an important part, so we'll have to talk about it. Okay, so we'll discuss a little bit 
how one could build such a trigger. The second thing uh, we want is we know convection heats, it changes the moisture in the atmosphere, and we haven't really talked and won't really talk much about momentum changes because just there's no time. But I just want to highlight it also changes the momentum in the vertical, the momentum distribution in the vertical. So somehow we want to predict the vertical distribution of this heating, moistening, drying, so on and so forth. And that's done by something that in convection parameterization speak is called the cloud model. And again, every convection parameterization you find, even the simplest ones from the 1960s, make assumptions about what is this vertical distribution. And finally, we need to say how much overall, how much convection is there in the vertical. So once we've decided there is convection, we've calculated what the vertical profiles of the heating and moistening might be. But then we have to say, um, what is the magnitude of these profiles, right? Is it a lot of heating or a little heating? So the, the cloud model predicts the structure in the vertical. And then the closure, usually the closure assumption determines how much of that do we get. In other words, what is the magnitude of these profiles that we have saw? Okay, so we're going to discuss each of those three aspects today. Um, we're going to spend the whole two lectures doing it, and then after that, you should have a pretty good overview of how it's done. Now, to make this work, I will actually use an example convection scheme, um, and we will mostly focus on the details of that, not because I want you to know all the details, but to give you an example of what thought processes do we have to go through to build a convection scheme. And that will help you understand the convection schemes you are dealing with when you look at your models. So the first thing you've already learned is, is if you want to analyze a convection scheme, you need to analyze those three things. What, are, what is it doing for triggering, for deciding whether there is convection? What is it doing for the vertical distribution of things? And what is it doing for the overall amount? All right, we'll start with the cloud model as our first uh, um, of the three components that we are going to discuss. The order why I'm doing it this way around will become apparent as we as we go through. But the cloud model is sort of the half of the convection scheme. Okay, so it, it's it's the one very important thing. We already know what the equations that we have to deal with are. So the point is that we, we the, the overall task of the convection scheme is to calculate the collective effects of all the clouds, the convective clouds in the grid. Board. This is often forgotten because of the way convection schemes are implemented. We're not trying to simulate one convective cloud. We're trying to simulate the ensemble of, of all the clouds that there might be in our grid box. So think of a 200 by 200 kilometer box. There will be lots of convective clouds in that box, small ones, big ones, and so on. And we want to know what is the overall effect of all of them, not what is one cloud doing. Okay. And yesterday, we, we saw that we can represent those effects by these quantities called Q1 and Q2 and so on and so forth. So basically, we have this, uh, if we can calculate Q1, then we know what the overall effects of, of convection on this uh, grid box will be. And hence, as a result, uh, so radiation is done by a different parameterization, so we don't have to worry about that. Someone else is taking care of this. But in a convective grid cell, where there's lots of convection going on, we now need to find expressions for condensation and evaporation. And most importantly, we need to find an expression for this flux term, right? This vertical divergence of the subgrid scale flux of the quantity we are interested in, heat, moisture, and so on and so forth. So there's more than one. Uh, excuse me. Yeah? So uh, when you're looking at convection, so yeah. grid scale convection, there will be abrupts and abrupts that happen somewhere else. So how is that taken care of? Well, you will know at the end of the two hours. Okay. All right? It's going to take a while to explain. Okay. And that's the purpose of these two lectures now. So hang in there, okay. is my advice. All right. The most common approach today, and pretty much every climate model and many of the regional models and weather prediction models, use an approach called the mass flux approach. Okay? So, um, Here's the two terms that we have to describe, this one and that one. And the mass flux approach is about dealing with this eddy transport term. So what we're trying to do with the mass flux approach is we're looking for a simple expression of this term. Okay, and now we're going to spend probably 20 minutes or more on this board because 
This is kind of crucial, and you can't find it in a single textbook. Trust me, I've looked. Um, so how does this mass flux approach work? So the goal, <coughs> the goal of the next 15 minutes or so is to find a simple expression for this flux term, which we can then plug into this equation for convection, right? So our idea is we, we are in a grid box where there's convection going on. And we would like to describe what this flux looks like in that convective grid box. All right, here we go. So the task we are setting ourselves is we want to know what is W prime. And I use phi here simply as any variable that you want to plug in. So this works for any variable that you want to plug in. Okay? So this is the question mark, what is this? What is phi prime? Okay, so we're starting with our usual um, decomposition of the variables that we are interested in, and we have, there's two. So we say phi is a mean in our grid box plus some perturbation from that mean. So at any point within the grid box, this is the value of phi. And we can see we need the same thing for w, so we, we write the vertical motion in the same way. So we say there's a mean grid motion and there's a perturbation. Okay? So then what we can do is we can calculate this, this quantity. We multiply w and phi, and then we take the average. All right? So that becomes then w bar plus w prime times phi bar plus phi prime. And then we take the average of that. Yeah? So that becomes very simple. So we get w bar times phi bar. We just multiply this out. Average plus W prime phi bar and average that plus W bar phi prime and we average that and then plus W prime phi prime and we average that. Yeah? From our rules yesterday, we know that phi prime bar equals zero and anything, any product like uh, Let's call it psi bar, phi prime bar is also zero. Okay, that we discussed this yesterday already. So that means these two terms here become zero. And we end up with this very simple expression that w phi bar equals w bar times phi bar plus w prime phi prime bar. Okay, and so from that we know w prime phi prime bar is nothing else than W phi bar minus W bar phi bar. Yep. Okay, so this may not look like it helps us a lot yet, but it does. So that, that's our first sort of result. Um, I'm going to actually write the score off because we're going to do a long, long math, but I'm going to write this result up here because we're going to need it. W prime phi prime bar equals W phi bar minus W bar phi bar. Okay? So that's that was very simple. So now we're going to make an assumption. Now we're going to think about convection. So here's our grid box. And we have little convective clouds in it. Something like that. So we call this area cloud. C, we're going to use the subscript C for it, and we're going to call this area anything that isn't cloud, the environment, E. <coughs> and then for any variable, we can write the average of our, our grid box as, oh, so the, the other thing we need to know is what's the area, the, the fractional area that's covered by these clouds, and we call that sigma. And that's just the area of the cloud divided by the total area of the grid box. Okay? Just call it sigma because we can. Could call it anything, but it's typical in the literature it's called sigma. Alright, so then any variable sigma, the average of the entire grid box is simply the uh, area that's covered with cloud times the variable average over all the clouds plus 1 minus sigma um, and the variable average <coughs> over the environment. Does that make sense? Uh, we're just writing the, we're expressing our 
area average as stuff inside the convective clouds and stuff outside the convective clouds. Yeah, pretty, pretty straightforward. All right, what do I want to do? Okay, so from that we can write the first term here, W phi bar, is then also sigma times W phi average over the cloud plus one minus sigma w phi average over the environment, right? So that's simply applying this decomposition to this term, which is the first term here, which we want to do something to, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to Reynolds average again, but this time only we, we're going to do this in two areas inside the cloud, so and outside the cloud. So the inside the cloud bit, this will become clearer. What I just said will become clearer if I write the math. We can we can use the same equation that we had before. So the W phi average over the cloud is from this up here, the W cloud phi cloud. But then we have to add the perturbations, and I'm using double prime now just to make it different from what we had before. Phi prime average over the cloud. So this is just using this averaging technique, but only over the cloud events. Okay. Likewise for the environment, W phi environment is W environment phi environment plus W double prime phi double prime environment. So this, the difference is that the, the, the single primes were for the whole grid box, deviations over the whole grid box. The double ones are really just within the area that we're considering. And now here's the first assumption that Maslow's parameterizations make, and there'll be many as we go along, and you never know them unless you go through this. The first assumption we're going to make is that these are small. So we are saying the variations within the cloud and the variations within the environment are much smaller than the differences between the two. And that's a fair assumption. So actually, the, the difference between the cloudy and environment is what matters the most. The variations within the clouds and the variations within the environment, they exist, but they are much smaller than the variations between the two. Okay, so that means we can neglect those two terms. Okay, and as a result, we can write out this first term, this one, which we are interested in as sigma WC phi C, because that's all that's left this bit, yeah, this we we got rid of, plus one minus sigma um, W E phi. So that's the approximation that once we've assumed that those two terms are small. So that's one bit that we need. We also know so that's the that's one term that we need. So then we also need this term, but that term is really easy to write, even though the math will be slightly messy at the end. But that's just uh, W bar is nothing else than sigma times WC plus 1 minus sigma WE. And we need to multiply that with phi bar. Phi bar is just sigma <coughs> phi over the clouds plus 1 minus sigma of the environment. Oops. Does that make sense? So this is just taking W bar, it's just decomposing it into cloud and environment, this is just taking the phi and decomposing it into cloud and environment. Okay? You can see what's coming now, right? I, I hope you're not too distressed by it because it will be a bit messy temporarily. <laughs> because what we need to do is we need to we want to calculate this, ultimately. So to do it, we need to take this term minus that term. Can we do it? Who's up for it? Who's up for it? All right. I'm, I have a headache, so it will be fun to do this with a headache. All right. So we'll do this. So let's multiply everything out straight away. Are you up for that? So the first term is just this. So that's sigma WC phi C. That we can leave alone. Plus, and now we multiply this out, W E phi E 
minus sigma w e phi e. We have to be very careful because if we make a mistake, we're going to be sorry. No, 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 no. There's no sigma squared just yet. No, no. I'm multiplying this out. So it's w phi. There's no sigma. There's no squared. We're coming to the square. So I, all I've done is I've taken this term and I made it into three instead of two. Yeah? You still with me? People in the back can't see a thing. You have to hang in there. <laughs> all right? You can, you can do it on a piece of paper while I'm doing it up here because it's not hard. It's just, just messy. Okay, now we do multiplication of our multiplying this stuff out. So that's going to be more fun. Now we're getting to the squares. And we need to take a minus. Okay. So, first one, we multiply this one with that one. We get minus sigma squared W C phi C. Yeah? With me? Everybody with me? All right. And then we get, uh, we're not going to get two adventures here, we're going to get minus sigma times 1 minus sigma, right? Let's not multiply that out just yet, otherwise we're going to have a real headache, W, C, Y, E. So that's that one multiplied with that one. Now we do this one, minus sigma times 1 minus <coughs> sigma, W, E, multiply this by C. And then finally, we get minus 1 minus sigma squared W E phi E. Okay? Hopefully, we've done it right. It's different from what's on the piece of paper, but hey, it's not a piece of paper, right? Okay. So, um, one of the things we will do is we will need to multiply this one out, so I'll do that. So that's minus W E phi E minus minus gives plus two sigma W E phi E and then we get sigma squared with a minus minus sigma squared W E phi E. Yeah, that's just this term here. So let's have a look at this. We call that plus W E phi E and the minus W E phi E here. So we can get rid of that. Okay, now if we collect everything, what I want to do is, I will convince you this will work. We want to multiply out sigma times 1 minus sigma. So let's collect all the terms with the sigma times 1 minus sigma. Um, so let's have a look at the WC phi C bit. So this is a sigma minus sigma squared, which is sigma times 1 minus sigma. So we have a WC phi C. So it means we've done this one and we've done that one. Okay? You already have two terms that have a sigma, a 1 minus sigma. So we have minus WC phi e, that's this one, Take. and we have minus w e phi c, that's that one, Take. and now we have this guy here, we have minus sigma squared, we can't do anything, there's a plus two sigma and there's a minus one sigma, right, so that gives us a plus one sigma, so that gives us a plus W E Phi E. Right? Are you with me? I think I did this right. Quick check of my thing. Did this right? 
sigma. And this is Wc minus Wp times phi bar c minus phi bar e. Yeah, that's just making this fit into a product of this and that. Okay, so this is our expression for the This is our expression for this flux um, in the end. There's several things we don't like in here, right? So if we wanted to use this in a model, we can imagine that the cloud bit, we can write a cloud model to actually calculate these numbers. But then environmental numbers we don't really have in the, in the model. We have grid means, and we can probably write a model for the cloud one. So these environment ones are actually not, not good. So Let's see whether we can't get rid of them, because we don't know them in the model. So one thing we do know, though, is that W prime bar, so the whole grid box variation, is zero. We also know that the, the, um, that the W really, the, the primes, the primes in W, the deviations from the mean, are the cloud and the environment. So we can therefore write sigma wc plus 1 minus sigma we equals 0. So this is another assumption that all mass flux schemes that are currently around make, that is essentially <coughs> the convective motion is contained within one grid box. What goes up in the grid box must come down in the same grid box, right? So this is the air going up inside the cloud, this is air going down outside the cloud, and they add to zero when weighted by the areas that they occupy. So this, so, so this is also kind of quasi right? Sorry? Can you say this is also kind of quasi no? No, not really. This is just saying the we don't want convection to lead to net vertical motion in the grid block. So the, the net vertical motion from convection is zero. It's just an assumption. But, Will happen only for the last thing, right? Not for the middle thing. Well, but the, the question is whether this is a good assumption. Yes. Okay. So that assumption is good when when the cos equilibrium holds it, right? No, it's a good assumption when the grid boxes are large. And then this cos equilibrium works. No, not necessarily. It's like the two are not connected. Quasi equilibrium is that convection opposes the large scale completely in over a certain time scale. We'll come back to that. This one just says, as the convective motion develops in the grid box, the, the up goes down in the same grid box. The, the, so the convection could be in equilibrium, but the, the downward motion could be far away in another grid box, in principle. The two have nothing, there's no strong relationship between the two assumptions. They're, they're just different assumptions. Okay. So here we don't need to make any quasi-equilibrium assumption. We're just saying the effect of the convection in terms of up and down stays in the same grid box. It happens all in this one grid box. You can already see this is a quite a bad assumption when, when, they, when the resolution of your model gets higher and higher. Right? And um, as you will probably see when we as we go through the parameterization, a lot of the assumptions we are making breaking down <coughs> breaking down at high resolution. And the response of the community is usually not to worry about this. I just see, and the model still seems to be working, and sort of from an engineering point of view, we can just keep doing what we're doing. Scientifically, many of our assumptions have broken down by the time we get to 50 kilometer, 20 kilometer, 10 kilometer resolution. Cumulus parameterizations, as we use them, shouldn't work anymore, All right? And yet they do somehow help the model, so people keep them. But in principle, we've broken lots of assumptions, as you'll see. So this is one assumption. If we make that assumption, we can write an equation for the environmental uh, vertical velocity as a function of the cloud one. So let's do that. That becomes minus sigma WC divided by 1 minus sigma, right? We can stick that in here. And then W prime phi prime is sigma times 1 minus sigma times WC minus 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 gives plus sigma wc divided by one minus sigma. Yeah, 
um, <laughs> that means the times is phi c minus phi e. And that's sigma times 1 minus sigma. And then we need to put it onto 1 minus sigma. To do that, this becomes wc minus sigma wc plus sigma wc. And that's convenient. We like that. Phi c minus phi e. And so you see this goes. And the 1 minus sigma goes as well. This is 1. So we are stuck, we are arrived at a very nice looking equation. The W prime phi prime is sigma times WC times phi C minus phi E. Well, we've almost achieved what we wanted to do. All right, so now um, you can see we are almost at this term in the, in, in the equation there. So we multiply this rho to get rho w prime phi prime bar, and that becomes rho times sigma times wc phi c minus phi e. And now we come to the first bit of the mass flux approach. We make by we define a mass flux as rho times sigma times wc. So we call that mc. It's the mass flux inside the cloud, and it's just the definition. So that's the definition of the mass flux, right? This is how much mass is being transported inside the clouds. And we know it's this expression on the right hand side. So there's only one more thing left to be done. Um, so basically, we now have an equation that says rho times w prime phi prime, which is what we want, is the mass flux inside the clouds times uh, the variable inside the cloud, average over the cloud, minus the variable average over the environment. Yeah? So that's just... Okay, so that's almost what we want for our model to work. The only problem with this still is, so let's assume we can calculate this, and I'll show you in a minute how we do that. Um, let's assume we can calculate this as well. We need a model to calculate those two, obviously. Um, but the environmental value is still something we don't like, just like we didn't like the environmental value for the velocity because we don't have it, we don't know what it is. So let's, to, to replace that with the grid point value, we play the same trick again, but this time on phi. So phi is, of course, sigma times phi c plus 1 minus sigma phi e. So we solve that for phi e as we've done before. That becomes again minus sigma phi c divided by uh, 1 minus sigma, plug that in, so rho w prime phi prime is mc times phi c minus, minus minus is plus, uh, plus sigma phi c 1 minus sigma, and it works exactly the same way as before. Um, hang on, I'm making, I'm making a mistake. There's a, there's a phi bar missing. Phi e equals phi bar minus, right? Because this wasn't zero. In the, in the case of velocity, we set it to zero. But in the case of this, we can't do that. The temperature isn't zero or the uh, moisture isn't zero. So it's really this one. <coughs> so let's write it properly. Phi C minus phi bar minus sigma minus minus is plus sigma phi C divided by 1 minus sigma. That's what we have. No, it's not. Hang on. Hang on. I'm making a mess of this. Let's start over. So, phi e is what we want to calculate, and that is phi bar minus sigma phi c, and they're both divided by 1 minus sigma. Now we can 
by z uh, minus this thing phi bar minus sigma by z one minus sigma, and that is of course m c times phi z <coughs> minus sigma by z minus phi bar plus sigma by z divided by 1 minus sigma. So this is cool, we get rid of these two, and we're almost happy. So we have mc divided by 1 minus sigma times phi c minus phi bar. So this looks good, because phi bar we know, phi c we assume we can calculate, mc we assume we can calculate, but now again, we've got sigma in here, which we don't know how to calculate at this point. So we make another assumption, which a mass flux scheme, or mass flux scheme on Earth made today. And we'll talk a bit tomorrow how that actually is, is a problem. But right now, this is what everybody does. So that we say sigma is much smaller than one. So that means the area that we expect to be covered in our grid box with convective cells needs to be small compared to the size of the grid box. It turns out from observations, I'll show you tomorrow, it's a very good assumption as long as your grid box is 100 kilometer squared or more. But you can already see as you make your grid boxes smaller and smaller, it becomes a bad assumption. So there's another reason why mass flux schemes shouldn't really work anymore at high resolution, and yet people keep using them. So with that assumption, we can say um, rho w prime phi prime uh, is approximately mass flux in the cloud times the variable average inside the cloud minus um, the area average. So we found an expression for this flux that we were looking for. Okay? Done. Took us a while, but it always does. Okay, so we're done. We're nicely done. Um, I've summarized on this slide what we actually did. So we started with Reynolds averaging, and then we had to make assumptions. So one assumption was, was we divided the uh, grid box, uh, or the area in which we are interested, into convective elements and environment. That was assumption number one. We assumed that the variations within the cloudy area and the environment are small compared to the difference between the two. It's another assumption. Uh, we assume that the cloud area itself is small compared to the total area that we're dealing with. And we made this assumption <coughs> on vertical velocity. And then we get this. And this quantity rho sigma wc is the famous mass flux. Okay. So this is what underpins, uh, and, and the sigma, which we'll talk about quite a bit tomorrow, is the fractional area that's covered with convection. Okay. So there we are. So now we need to find equations to solve the problem. We need to find equations for these quantities inside the cloud. That's our hex task. The environment is this one we know. Our model calculates that from its equations. So we need to find uh, values for mc and phi c. Okay. <laughs> to do that, we'll make a, another assumption. Um, so we, we look at a single element. So the, the easiest way to visualize this is we need we now need a model for how a cumulus cloud works. And then we need to add over all the cumulus clouds in the box. So the model how cumulus clouds work, almost all, actually all smart flag schemes that I know use what's called the entraining plume model to represent convective clouds. Okay. The entraining plume model basically says there's mass going up in the Cloud. Um, the cloud interacts with its environment by dragging in through turbulent mixing, but also through organized flow, potentially, uh, drags in air into the cloud. That process is called entrainment. And, uh, and it pushes out air into the environment. So some of the air goes out of the cloud into the environment. That process is called detrainment. Um, yeah. And uh, then there's condensation inside 
this cloud. So when we are talking about heat and, and uh, moisture, we have to take this into account. The next assumption we're going to, if you have this picture in mind, you can write equations. So this is the continuity equation for one of these cloud elements. And the only assumption we're making is there's no storage. So there's a steady state solution. So the partial derivatives with respect to time are zero. So the right-hand sides here should be dm by dt and dm ds by dt and dq by dt inside the cloud. But we assume that there is no temporal variation and that this, we're actually looking at the steady state ensemble of convective clouds. So then we can write equations for each of the elements. So um, epsilon is the rate of entrainment. Um, the units at this point are 1 over second. So how, many, how much air per second gets entrained into this? Uh, for, and from a mass perspective, we basically know the change of mass flux with height as we move upwards is simply we are adding mass through entrainment and we are losing mass through detrainment. That's the only two things that happen. So that's a very easy equation. And if you think about, let's do moisture, it's a bit easier. So if you think about the moisture equation, the air that's being entrained will have the properties of the environment, which we already approximated by the properties of the grid mean. So if we are entraining the grid mean air, right? The detrained air will have the, whatever properties the cloud has will be detrained into the environment. So that's just the Q of the cloud. We will lose humidity by condensation because it will be converted to liquid water, right? And that will describe the change uh, and then there's this vertical flux divergence, and that should be the change of humidity and time, which we assume to be zero. Okay, so from that, we can then write equations how these fluxes, the mass flux, this is the same for dry static energy, the moisture flux, how they change with time. So we have a cloud model. Okay, so we have equations that describe how things change with time. Yeah, for each of the variables. And then all we need to do is we need to add over all the clouds that have been in the grid box. And now different parameterizations make different assumptions. Um, the, some try and calculate um, the whole spectrum of clouds. So you, you could imagine you can write one equation for each of the clouds you assume to be present in your grid box. Okay. So there's a parameterization, a very famous one called Arakawa Shugo, that says, well, we'll do a we'll assume there's different depth clouds in the grid box but we'll assume that we can sum over each depth category. So we don't have to take every cloud, but we make one calculation per cloud per depth of cloud, right? But the mathematics of that becomes very complicated, actually. It turns out to be difficult. So people then couldn't implement that in their GCMs. The most common assumption that people make is the so-called bulk mass flux approach, where you simply sum over all the clouds, and you write one equation for the entire ensemble of clouds. Right? And you represent that by one value. And this is what this looks like. Um, so this is from the Tikur parameterization. It doesn't really matter. It's really a good example of a bulk mass flux scheme. And this is what we're going to work with for the rest of the lectures. Um, so you can see there's an equation for the mass. Um, these big EUs are simply rho times the little epsilons and deltas that we have. Um, and then you have one for heat, one for humidity, those we've already seen. There's an equation, you can write an equation for liquid water if you want, so the, the water that's carried in the cloud. Um, and you may have uh, cloud water outside the, outside the convective clouds because you have a prognostic cloud scheme, then that gets entrenched, so on and so forth. So you can write an equation for rainwater if you want. There are equations for momentum, which are very simple, no sources, just so entrainment and detrainment. And you can write one which looks very complicated, so let's not worry about it too much for vertical velocity as well, or kinetic energy <coughs> of the updraft. Okay? Again, it's not about the details of these equations. The, the key thing to remember is there's really three, three uh, terms in every equation in principle. One is entrainment of environmental properties, one is detrainment of cloud properties into the environment, and, and the third one is if there are sources within the cloud for the quantity that we have sources or sinks. So for instance, for, for humidity, condensation is a sink. But you can see that sink becomes a source over here for liquid 
right? Because you're converting one into the other. So that's the concept of this. And the idea is very, very simple, and you saw it in the previous slide, so I'm just going to go back. So if you imagine this is one model layer, mass flux is coming in from the bottom, entrainment happens, sources happen, and detrainment happens, and that can, from that you can calculate the mass flux, the moisture flux, the heat flux that goes up into the next layer. Yeah? Does that make sense? So that's how it all works. That's the, the basic premise of a mass flux convention scheme. You can use these equations, and I will show you that because it's kind of a helps us understand how convection works. You can also rewrite the equations to actually calculate the properties inside the cloud. So the equations I've shown you so far, these guys, they don't calculate properties inside the cloud, right? They calculate fluxes. So they they calculate the sorry. Yes, yes. So precipitation is stuff that falls. There's liquid water, this this stuff that stays within it. But in this, as you can see, for precipitation, even the way the equation is written, there is only there's there's also the possibility that rainwater is carried up by the undercurrent. Here we don't entrain any rainwater because we don't have a prognostic equation for rainwater outside the convection. But inside the convection we do have this equation. And so we detrain some rainwater. This is the generation of rain, which is a sink of liquid water. That's just water conversion and other processes, accretion processes. And then we assume a certain fraction of that water will fall out, and a certain fraction will stay in the upper. So all the equations are, have a similar structure, as you can see. But they are all equations for fluxes. And you may be interested in an equation for the properties rather than the fluxes. And all you need to do is let's do which one are we going to do? Um, one that I do on my little piece of paper. Let's do humidity. Um, so we have two equations from there. We have the equation that writes the, the humidity flux as a function of height, right? Steady state, no, no time derivatives left. And that's just entrainment times environmental Q minus detrainment times cloudy Q, updraft Q, uh, minus condensation. Yeah? That's just copying this. And the other equation we have is dMu by dz, which is just entrainment. That's just the mass continuity equation, minus detrainment. Okay? So we also can write this one. DMU QU DZ is of course nothing else than MU DQU DZ plus QU, that's just using the product rule, DMU by DZ. Yep. Yeah. Okay, and that becomes swapping terms now, QU times EU minus DU, right? I'm just replacing DMU dz with this. Uh, plus MU DQU by QU inside dz. So that's these two terms. But we also know from the equation up here that equals EU Q bar minus du qu minus rho cu. Yeah. So then we solve for this one. So mu dq. So our goal is to calculate how q changes in the upgraph is high. And so this is just that one. Equals EU Q bar minus DU Q U minus rho C U. I hope I didn't make a mistake, but I don't think I did. And then we need to multiply this one out, bring it to the other side, minus EU Q U. 
and then minus, minus gives a plus du, q, u. So we see the detrainment terms go from this. That makes sense because it tells us that the training doesn't change the properties of the updraft. It really just takes them and puts them in the environment. But entrainment does change the properties of the updraft. So does compensation. So our equation for the moisture as a function of height inside the updraft becomes something like we take EU minus EU over MU. This way had, we had the mass flux here, so we have to divide by it. If we make it negative, and if we make it negative, then it becomes updraft minus environment. <coughs> and then we also have minus rho times Cu divided by Mu. So now this division by Mu is basically simply calculating the rates of change as per unit mass, right? Per unit mass wise, that's going on. So that's our equation for the updraft property. So you can already see combining these mass flux equations of the, the mass with the equation for some property becomes something quite handy, um, which we might use quite a bit when we look at this later, um, when we look at the flow. Right, so these are then equations that can easily be derived. Um, sometimes, and I just want to give you a heads up on this, this EU divided by MU is often given another epsilon, another entrainment rate. So people often call that the entrainment rate. And in models, that's usually the entrainment rate that is applied. And I just want to give you a heads up. That's different from the entrainment rate we wrote down in the individual cloud equations, in that if you look very carefully at the units, it has different units. This one has units per meter. So that tells you how much entrainment happens per meter of ascent. Right? rather than per second in time. So um, it's, just a, it's just a conversion, if you think of it. It's, not, it's nothing dramatic, but you have to be careful which one you're dealing with when you look at your model. All right? Most models, the entrainment rate is this, it's, and the unit is per meter. Okay, just a, a few words on mixing. So this whole entrainment, why do we need to worry about this entrainment stuff? Well, it's because it happens in the real world. Um, these are observations um, in shallow cumulus clouds. This is high above cloud days. They're very old, and this is when people realize there's something happening. It, uh, of the water content divided by the adiabatic water content. So the adiabatic water content is, you know that there's air going up, from cloud base, at cloud base, just below cloud base, the water content is zero. So you can calculate how much water you would expect to be in that cloud if there was, uh, if, if it was an adiabatic lifting of the cloud. And they looked at shallow clouds mainly because there's no precipitation. So really all the water stays in the cloud. And what they found is that the water inside the cloud that they measured was only 50% of the adiabatic or less of the adiabatic water content. And as you went up, it decreased, actually, with height. And they were saying, so what, what's going on? And what's going on is, of course, dry air from the environment. As the cloud rises, the plume rises, dry air from the environment gets mixed in. And that mixing leads to drying inside the updraft. And that's compensated by evaporating some of the water to make it saturated again. Right? So the updraft stays saturated, but because dry air is being mixed in, some of that water evaporates. And so we have less water in the updraft than what we would expect if there was no mixing. In a thermodynamic diagram, the mixing, the effect of the mixing looks something like this. Um, so we looked at these diagrams yesterday, the same one as yesterday. If there was no mixing at all, the cloud would follow this path here and we would get very deep clouds that are very strong because they have high cave. But the more mixing we assume happens with the environment. So mixing with the environment in this sort of diagram form is very simple. It's very simple to understand. All you're saying is we're, instead of going up this curve, we're, we're dragging this red curve towards the black curve. And the more we mix, the more closely it will resemble the black curve. If mixing was infinite, the red curve would become the black curve and there would be no more buoyancy, right? Because we would replace the cloud air entirely with environment. So the effect of mixing is to drag this moist adiabat towards the environment. And the more you mix, the 
closer you get to the environment. And so one of the big effects of mixing is, and that's one of the big discussions in models, is that, um, that you're making the clouds shallow. So the more you mix, the more likely it is that you will not reach the, the very high tops. Right? And so there was a debate in cumulus parameterization land in the 60s and 70s, because if you mixed, if you didn't mix, you got the uh, cloud top heights that were observed, but the clouds were way too strong. But if you mixed, you made about the right strength clouds, but they didn't reach the heights that uh, you would, would observe. And this is, to this day, this is a problem in cumulus parameterizations, especially if you have this approach of a single bulk cumulus scheme. So if you apply a lot of mixing, the clouds go too shallow, um, but they have about the right strength. If you apply no mixing, they go to about the right height, but they're way too strong. There's way too much water, way too much rain coming out of them. So that's a dilemma that we have. All right, so now I'm going to quickly go through some of the assumptions that, are, that we still need to make. Um, so we have a few parameters in the model that we haven't specified yet, right? So for instance, to, to be able to solve this cloud model that we've written now, we need to do two things. We need to know the values at cloud base of everything, because we start our calculation. Remember, our equations are d by dz. So we, we, uh, we are, once we know what happens at cloud base, we can solve the equations going up. Um, so that's one we need to do. We leave that. Um, and the second one, um, we, we need to know what is this mixing What's the strength of the mixing, both in some, into and out of the cloud? So we need to make some assumptions about that. All right. For the first one, we'll look at the closure as well as the trigger model, which we'll talk about later in the second lecture today. Um, but let's still think about entrainment and detrainment. So what do people do? And again, there's as many assumptions about how to deal with entrainment and detrainment as there's convection schemes. All right, so we, there's no way I can cover all of them. So I pick one example just to give you a flavor of how people think about this. And then when you work with convection schemes, you really need to look into what are people actually assuming about entrainment and detrainment in the scheme that you're using, because it's terribly important for how the scheme will perform and what it will actually do. So in the Tinker scheme, usually, and, and it it's actually happens in, in many other schemes as well, People divide this up and they say there's two processes that can lead to mixing of air into the cloud. One is turbulence at the side, and that turbulence is simply shear driven turbulence. Because as, you, as the cloud goes up, it has a vertical velocity. The environment is near zero vertical velocity, if anything slightly subsiding. Um, so there will be, at the edge of the cloud, there will be shear. And that shear will generate turbulence, right? And that turbulence will generate eddies that mix some of the dry air in and mix some of the moist air out of the cloud. You can see that in real convection, that's why it's sort of bubbly at the side. So it's not straight at the side, but it's actually wiggly. Clouds are wiggly at their sides, right? But then they also, many schemes allow for organized inflow into the cloud um, and organized outflow out of the cloud. And so that becomes the organized entrainment and detrainment. And they are very much tunable things. And a lot of people use them to tune their convection schemes to behave in certain ways. Okay. So, so, so this organized means multiple grid or? No, within the grid box. So you're assuming that there's inflow within, into the clouds within the grid box that is organized. And ensemble. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So the turbulent ones. It's often constants that are being used. Um, so here's an example. Don't take them too literally because every convection scheme uses different ones. But so in the deep pillar parameterization for the longest time, the deep convective entrainment rate for this turbulent part was assumed just to be one times 10 to the minus four per meter. And for shadow convection, it's bigger. And the argument why is it big or small is you go back to entraining plume theory and you will find that the amount of entrainment is proportional to the radius of the clouds, or in inversely proportional, in that smaller clouds have higher entrainment rates than bigger clouds. And so, therefore, since deep convective clouds are big, 
we give them small entrainment rate, and since shallow convective clouds are small, we give them large entrainment rates. And in the TK scheme, the organized entrainment for a long time was, was related to the moisture convergence. So basically, the assumption was if there was moisture convergence into the grid box, some of that convergence is also leading to inflow into the clouds in particular. I don't particularly like this, but that's what was done. All right, so I'm just reporting, don't shoot the messenger. Um, it's the same as pool, right? Yes, it's a bit of a cooking exercise, actually. For detrainment, uh, you do the same thing. And, and, and for the turbulent part, as you can see, the, the same numbers are used in the TK scheme. That's basically saying, that's almost treating the ensemble of clouds that you're trying to represent like a single cloud. And it's been criticized heavily over the, the past decades as not being very good assumption for an ensemble of clouds. For a single cloud, the assumption is simply the eddy that takes uh, stuff out into the cloud by entrainment also takes stuff out of the cloud by detrainment, and it's the same. Therefore, the amount that goes in must equal the amount that comes out. Okay. And for a single cloud, that's a sensible assumption. But for an ensemble of clouds, it's not necessarily a, sen a sensible assumption because weaker clouds may detrain earlier than stronger clouds. And so therefore, in many models these days, the detrainment rate is made larger than the entrainment rate as the clouds go up. So you lose more mass than you gain. And the assumption there is that you're dealing with an ensemble of clouds. Some of the clouds are sort of weak. Some of them are strong. And the weak ones will stop earlier in the atmosphere than the strong ones. But again, it's highly um, tunable how, what people do, and people use this as a tuning knob in their models. The organized detrainment, there's different ways you can do it. Very simple models actually assume that once you hit an inversion, everything gets detrained, or 70% gets detrained, 30% goes to the next layer. And again, that becomes a tunable parameter in models, which people have found is very changes even things like the climate sensitivity of the model. If you, you know, that parameter that says how much mass am I detraining at the inversion and how much do I push through. You have, there is a more elegant way of doing this, and that is if you apply an equation for vertical velocity in your model, and in the TK scheme we did this in the 90s, we introduced this equation for kinetic energy. It's a complicated equation. It has a buoyancy term, which is a source term, and it has a drag term, which is the sink term, basically. Um, and that it's, it's a very old equation by Simpson and Winger. But I, I, I don't want to go into the details of this. If, if someone wants to, you can read the papers. Um, but basically, that what you then know is the vertical velocity of the updraft at every level. That's a very good thing to know. So it's very useful to have such an equation. Very few schemes have them actually. Very famous models like the Met Office model don't have an equation like this in there. Um, I don't think CAM has. I, you know, not many models have do, done this. But the nice thing about this is if you do know it, then your organized detrainment becomes easier to describe because what you can do is you can make the loss of mass proportional to the deceleration of the parcel. So what happens is your parcel hits some inversion. It will decelerate. So your vertical velocity equation will start to reduce the vertical velocity, but it will take a level or two before it gets to zero, depending how strong it is, how strong the parcel is and how strong the inversion is, right? Because that's this buoyancy term. You get into negative buoyancy, the parcel will slow down. Okay? And then you can say, okay, the mass flux at the level above divided by the mass flux at this level is simply the kinetic energy at the level above divided by the kinetic energy at the level below and the square root because mass flux goes with uh, vertical velocity linearly and kinetic energy goes with it quadratically. So we do the square root of that. And that's a very elegant way of working out how at the top of the cloud, how this detrainment, this organized transition from convection to stratiform happens. And this formulation in principle should, is even able to make anvils and things we talked about yesterday. But it can't make vertical motion in the anvils. It doesn't make circulations. It just creates static anvils, not very dynamic anvils. So this, uh, the it doesn't, doesn't take into account anything in the subcloud here, right? You are all doing everything from LC and above, right? Yes, so we come back to that. We'll come back to that. So we need to specify, the, as I said at the start, there's 
to put this cloud model to work, we need to specify what the starting point is, which we haven't done yet, and then how that evolves as we go higher up. So all we talked about is the evolution as we go higher up. 